Hi, I'm Jan Ozer. I'm chatting today with Simon Green, founder and CEO of Edit Cloud, a cloud-based platform that allows production teams to collaborate remotely using various editing software programs while providing access to accredited talent and integrated storage solutions. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So what is Edit Cloud for people who aren't familiar with the with the service? So Edit Cloud, what, what we do is we help large uh creative organizations move from traditional on-prem ways of creating content and we're moving them and transforming their business into the cloud um, and really you know how do we do that so we're doing that in three ways um, it's through tools um, so uh, obviously clues in the name we're doing all of that into, into the cloud so spinning up virtual workstations but what we also do is then connect talents that could be existing talent directories um, from within large organizations, but also third party freelance organizations. And then what we also do is um, uh, tr train that talent as well, because within that transformation process, I think what we recognize is that there's certainly creatives. They don't really like change. They can, they can be a, 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 a picky lot about how they, how, how we <laughs> like to use our tools. And so what we also do is make sure that they are well equipped uh, in order to do the job. But ultimately what we, what we believe in is that you shouldn't really be changing the tools that you're using. So for us, we have a very agnostic federated approach to cloud. Um, but we recognize there's a, there's a journey for businesses to move into that, that space. So, so what specific editing software does edit cloud support? So as I said, so we're, we're really agnostic. And so I've spent uh, all of my, my career um, as a prof production professional. So I began as an editor, was a producer, a director. Um, and I think the thing that is that I believe in is that um, you can't just force tools on, on creatives. Everyone will have nuances in, in tools that they want to use and, um, and how they use them. So for us, Edit Cloud was really built with that at the core. Um, how do you build something that is um, agnostic and that we can federate with lots of different tools? Um, and ultimately, our, our objective is always to do it in the way it's going to drive the best creative outcome, but also is driving efficiency for the business, because obviously that's always um, a, a pertinent topic. So we, cover, you know, we can um, spin up Avids, we can spin up Adobe's uh, Resolve, but also broader than that, we don't just do video production, so we can do graphics and animation, etc. Ultimately, it's around connecting talent to a workstation in the cloud. And then what we're doing is calibrating that workstation to make sure that it's delivering the right tools to, to do the job. Okay. So when I think editing the cloud, I think, I think two things, number one is, you know, uploading and storage and number two is security. So how are you integrating with cloud storage providers and what's the latency of, of editing some of these extreme, you know, you're working with very, very high quality input formats, you know, how long yeah. is it going to take to get it into the cloud? How are you going to protect it and store it once it's up there? Yeah, it, no, it's, it's the right question. So I think um, this wouldn't work if there was lag. So we've been we've been working with our partners to to deliver this for uh, many years. This isn't just something that, that's happened overnight. And I think this was a non-starter if the editing experience and creative experience was anyway hampered uh, by the technology. Um, so we are our process is that when you're um, uh, capturing your content. That is going, you're uploading that once um, and that you are still doing this on the internet. So you are um, reliant on an internet speed. But once you've uploaded that once, where this becomes really efficient is that you can distribute that to many. So rather than just thinking, uh, I need to, you know, what we see time and again is people give it to one person and then they're either remoting into a machine in their office or they're sharing hard drives or Dropbox links and things like that. So the beauty of this is you upload it once and share it to many. In terms of the performance, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're basically uh, practically zero latency um, so that you you have that same experience as if you're in the edit suite. So ultimately, you know, I could be sat here as I am on a on a laptop, but really what I'm doing is controlling a really high spec machine that's very secure and nothing's on my local machine, um, but it responds as if it is. So I have that editing experience, but as soon as I log out, there's nothing here. So from a security point of view, to, to answer your, your other part of your question there, mm -hmm. is that it means that for me as, as an editor, I haven't had to um, 
uh, download any material or plug anything to my, my personal uh, computer, I can actually log in, do my work, have that work um, reviewed and agreed by the client. And then when that's done, I'm, I'm signed off and nothing exists on my machine. And we've had those, you know, we've had those um, horror stories, you know, we've had executive producers tell us, you know, where they've, um, they've done productions where they've spent a small fortune trying to get uh, media onto a hard drive. And then they put that on the back of a motorbike and ship it to the editor who's a <laughs> hundred miles away. And then it hasn't worked out for whatever reason. And they said they've actually had to go to that person's house, stand over their shoulder and make sure that everything is unplugged and deleted off their system because it's sensitive material. Um, and I think it's, it still surprises me that, that that still happens today. A, just because it's just incredibly expensive, but I just think the inefficiencies of that, and it's not scalable. And I think ultimately where, I think where the, the industry is, is at the moment is that there is a demand to scale, but it's got to scale in the right way. And I think doing those, those old practices, they're not secure. Um, and they're not scalable, you know, all those, those marginal gains, which we track, they, they clock up, you know, might, you might not feel it if you're a small production team, but I think, and, and, and I suppose typically for us, we're working with large organizations where those marginal gains of saving an hour here and, you know, a, a task there, when you multiply that by thousands, it's like, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of money. It adds up. What, you know, are you a, so I, I hire you guys as my service and I upload the, I upload the files to your, I mean, where are the files physically stored and is it your service? Is it my service? You know, how does yeah, that so, work? So we've run it in two ways actually, because I think when we began and I look, my background, as I said, is in traditional production and post-production and I've always been an owner operator and I used to run post facilities in Soho in London and the there's that traditional post for that service where you turn up and it's a bit like going into Soho house or it used to be in, in the sort of noughties where, you know, someone goes and gets your goat's milk latte and you sit on your comfy sofa and you get your Wi-Fi password and, and off you go and someone does all your work for you. And I think those days are, are they're, well, they're few and far between those sorts of experiences. You know, certainly if you're doing high end um, scripted content, you would expect that. Um, but I think that, most producers, editors that we're working with, they're usually spinning multiple projects at any given time. And so they, they don't have time to, to, to sit around. But I think for us, like, in terms of the, the service we're doing is recognizing that old way of working, but also encouraging people to think this isn't scalable. And we can see that because sadly, you know, post facilities are, are going out of business because that model doesn't really work. So we're also prescribing what does the future state look like? So to answer your question around storage, we provide that, dare I say, traditional post service where you could come to us and say, I need this project completing and we could take your rushes and put them on our storage. And that would be on AWS, you know, S3 buckets and, and complete that. But then I think what we're more interested in is then for the future state, which is how might you deploy onto the client's uh, uh, storage account? Because you know, these uh, large enterprise organizations get um, decent discounts from from the vendors. So it makes sense to use that discount in the production process. So we're working with, as I said, because we typically work with these large organizations, we're making sure they're maximizing on the discounts that they're getting rather than adding more unnecessary cost. And I think that's partly why, you know, coming back to what Edit Cloud is, we're not really just a service company. We are that operational transformation company because we understand that you know there is a service that we provide but i always talk to our partners in terms of value like why would you do this what's the point of this why would you move to the cloud um it's very easy for us to just flip into the old production mode which i know very well where it's like just get this job done and get it out out the door but actually because we're, we're constantly trying to show different ways of working and look i'm not saying we get get it right every time but we are at the very least showing data to say this worked, that didn't work. What would we do next time? Because ultimately every client that I talk to that's reluctant to move to the cloud, if I ever, you know, if I say to them, like, where do you think the inevitable future is? They'll say, oh yeah, we're going to be in the cloud. We're going to be embracing AI, et cetera. It's like, great. If that's the end goal, this is the journey. And there's going yeah. to be bumps in the road. You know, one of the, one of our partners, uh, ITV Studios, you know, we're, we're doing projects with them and they're, they're fantastic because 
from the get go, you know, some of their heads of production have said, listen, we know there's going to be bumps in the road, but we know that we have to go over them to get to get to the destination. And I think that's the attitude that we love to work with. And that's kind of where I um, uh, that's where I sort of collaborate with people is to say, how do we make sure that we're on always on a journey of um, discovery and improvement rather than just thinking we just have to get this one project done? It's like, yes, we do. We're not losing sight of that. It's got to be brilliant. But we've also got to think how how are we always making this better? Okay. The um, the fact that you're agnostic differentiates you from a lot of uh, vendor specific. Uh, products like some of the Adobe products that enable collaboration, but there's a lot of alternatives to collaborative editing on, in, in the cloud. Um, this is not the new uh, service or, or a new capability. If, if, I, if I don't know the services and if I don't know how, how to differentiate them, what are the questions I should ask myself when I'm evaluating the various alternatives for uh, editing in the cloud collaboratively? All uh, right. So uh, I'm going to, not that I'm trying to be a politician, but I'm going to take your question and answer just a slightly different question. <laughs> uh, but um, I think what I find refreshing as someone that has lived that traditional post life where you're selling, you're selling what you have. So I used to have a, a few studios dotted around London and as facilities do, they sell what they have. So if I've got a building with 40 Avid suites, that's what I'm selling. What I found really refreshing with Edit Cloud is that I don't have that agenda. So yeah, so I think the the agenda that I go in with is like, how are you trying to check? How are you? What sort of transformation? And it's not necessarily about technology either. Um, the work that we've recently done with ITV was um, because strategically they're trying to be more sustainable. They're trying to be more efficient, um, and. Um, and the work that we've done recently was about moving them from being on-prem Avid and we've moved them to in the cloud using Adobe. And that wasn't because they suddenly woke up one day saying we're going to work on Adobe. They, you know, they, their business was trying to, their business was, is looking to drive efficiencies, drive into the cloud and the efficiencies that we laid down with when threefold. So we actually said you could do a hybrid Avid, you could do a cloud Avid, or you could do a cloud Adobe. And the combination, um, not the combination, the, the way we presented that was that the Adobe one offered the greatest, um, uh, alignment to their objectives. And so we said, great, well, let's do this. But the, the caveat to that was their teams who they'd worked with for you know, a couple of decades weren't familiar with those tools. No problem. We trained them. We upskilled them. We worked with our partners at Adobe. And together we designed a very a bespoke training course for unscripted content producers and editors. So we didn't just train the editors. We trained the producers to say this is a new way of working. And it's you know, on the whole, it's been really good. We had a 96% um, uh, uh, satisfaction rating from from the experience and rolling that out again it's not it, it's not been with, without people saying hey how do we do this and this is how i used to do it there used to be a button here so of course we expect that but this is the first step of really uh you know seismic change and i think the other positive is some of those producers and editors have been happy because uh whilst i'm sure lots of them are throwing their keyboards against the wall going i can't do this I think they also recognize that, wow, I've been able to be on the job and learn a new skill in a new software and understand how to embrace some assistive AI technologies and fold that into um, uh, a bit of work. And so I think those that's a really great opportunity, I think, for, for studios like ITV to be able to be doing that, um, I think is amazing. And I'm honored to be part of that journey with them. But really, that's kind of how it's and yeah, the, the results are there to be seen. Okay. When, when you talk about collaborative editing, uh, part of it is somebody sitting next to you, you, you call them over and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Um, you know, an actual edit that's on the timeline. How does that work in the cloud? Is there some way to simulate that? Yeah. So one thing that we get, um, it's a good question because we get, we get challenged with that a lot. People hear the word cloud and they think, Oh, so that means I'm working from home. And um, 
That's not true. It just means that because you're in cloud, you're de-shackling all the complications of being able to move around. So we often say it's not about working from home. It's really about working from anywhere. So um, where we've run productions, um, we've had editors working from home, but they can work on the train. They could work when they're in the studio. So ITV, case in point, that operation where we've got 40 producers and editors working in various different locations. But what we recognize and what I would be the first to recognize as someone that's been an editor and a producer is there is a time where you need to be in an edit suite collaborating and, 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 uh, you know, bouncing ideas around. But then there's also a time where you just want to be productive and not disturbed. And so it's making the, the route between those two really easy because if everything's in the cloud, it's really easy for me to work from my home or my, my remote location, whatever that may be. But it's also really, then easy. all I need to do is relocate to an office where I can sit down with my producer, log in, and everything's there. I haven't had to do a media management onto a hard drive and then carry in a, you know, a wheelie case full of my, my kit. You know, and we still, you know, some of the agencies <laughs> that we're working with, um, I'm amazed that, you know, some of them are still shipping um, flight cases of, of edit suites and drives all around, not just the country, but around the world. So we have to ship it this place. You're like, God, how much is that costing? Um, so for me, you know, we were very blessed. One of our first um, uh, partnerships that we worked with, with uh, what is now Edit Cloud, it was Walter Murch, you know, the triple Oscar winning editor. And he um, he sort of gave me a good life lesson because when I said, oh, yeah, Walter, you know, the future is, is virtual. And he said to me, well, I've been doing virtual production for like 50 years. And I was like, what, what, what do you mean, Walter? Like, I mean, you are the master of editing. I'm not going to question you, but, and he said, well, look, when I was, when he was directing Return to Oz, he was explaining virtual editing for him was he would be in London and his editor was in Oregon and they would both be simultaneously looking through the film that was doing a virtual collaboration experience. And then roll forward 20 years, he was explaining to me that he was helping his friends, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, um, when Steven Spielberg moved on to Schindler's List and um, George Lucas and Walter Murch just helped to tidy up um, Jurassic Park, as you do, that they were collaborating via satellite trucks. And, <laughs> you know, roll forward another 20 or 30 years, you know, we were helping Walter um, doing his first feature film in uh, called Coup 53. Um, and we were helping him finish that um, in London. And then it was just as COVID, I think, was breaking out. So he was then in California. And we were working collaboratively as what is now Edit Cloud. And I suppose what his journey of an understanding of um, virtual collaboration has changed. And I suppose for him, it's not new, but it's been democratised so that for the rest of us, you and I are here doing a podcast now, 20 years ago, this would involve a, an OB truck and, you know, lots of money in order to do it. And I think for us, what we are also looking at within Edit Cloud is we're not, we're also in the same way we're not, uh, uh, we're not stuck to one um, collaboration tool. We'll plug in the best tool for the best um, outcome. So, uh, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, we work with Create, who have a fantastic collaboration tool built into their system. Um, Avid EOD have their, their new inbuilt um, tools with Microsoft. Uh, we also have an independent called Toda, which is really good too. We, I, th I suppose when people are working with Edit Cloud, yes, you have a, uh, a solution, but what you also have is a team of, of, of people that are, you know, curiously innovating and testing. And, and I think that's what you get from us because, uh, you know, it, if you just buy into one platform, like the traditional model, you know, you buy Avids and Kit, you sweat your asset for five years and then you go again. Whereas for us, technology is moving so fast. You've got to be looking every month about what's new, what can we plug in? So we're always testing new collaboration tools. Uh, we work very closely with Adobe. Um, we work very closely with Avid, understanding what are they trying to do. But more, most importantly for us is we translate that to our partners to say, why would you use this? Yes, it might be a nice fairy dust bit of AI, but why? 
what's this going to do? So I think the value that Edit Cloud brings to businesses is that we will translate that in terms of value to say this will save you time. And ultimately, okay. that's what we look at. So you're, you're looking at three three components of your product offering. One is the editing stuff we've talked about. The other is training and talent, whether there are two are training and talent. Talk to me about talent because we haven't really covered that before. What are you doing to help uh, expose your customers to more talent and to make sure the talent is uh, appropriate and trained for, for the tasks that are being assigned? Yeah, so what we're building out at the moment is um, is connecting talent in a in a more uh, transparent and meaningful way. So I think for the organizations that I've been fortunate enough to, to work with over the last um, couple of decades and, and certainly in the last couple of years, is understanding how they find and source and engage with talent is quite um, quite reactive. And, and I think that for an industry that wants to drive diversity in their storytelling, we're also very guilty of working with the same white middle-aged men that, that have been doing the job because it's easy, you know, um, and look, I've benefited from, from that in my career, but ultimately if you, um, you know, when, when you're doing a production that's high risk, you just think, well, I'll just go and work with Dave because I've worked with Dave for 20 years and he just gets me, but that doesn't help you shift the needle with sustainability and diversity. So that's, so with talent, then it starts with being more accountable about that process and that decision-making. So our edit cloud um what we're building out in the the front end of our app is being able to calibrate talent databases so for, as a starting point we're mostly working with existing internal databases because we're working with large organizations but bringing that through so that you can assign the talent um to um uh, uh to the jobs that, and that they have the right skill sets to do that and you can validate that so i suppose it's just making that that process a lot more transparent than just going back to the, well, I just, I've just worked with Dave for 20 years. It's like, well, let's understand what makes Dave so magical. Can we articulate that? Can we build some science behind that so that when we're associating a job and Dave might not be available, what skill sets um, can we actually find and apply? And can we offer that as training to allow other people to have the same opportunities? And I think that's that's really our, our ultimate output here. It's not just functional. Um, this is strategic around um, how do you actually drive um, opportunities um, into this. And, and also that um, it, it gives more levers to the media owners to then think, okay, how do we engage with talent in a different way and for different reasons? Okay. What about the training side? You talked about that one experience about, I mean, training, convincing anybody to leave an editor is – it's a staggering accomplishment because, um, I mean, I've been using Premier for 20 years and it would be very, very uh, upsetting and challenging to try and switch to Avid or switch to Final Cut Pro, God forbid. But um, how are you, you know, what what are the training services that you're offering? Are, are they all bespoke or are they are there some canned or how does that work? So the foundation, so again, that's why when we engage with businesses, we avoid just going straight into a training service or a production service will always ask them, what are you trying to achieve through a lens of transformation? And training is then obviously part of that. But if you can understand, well, why are you trying to move from Avid to Premiere? I agree with you, uh, Jan. It, it's, it's not because they're like, oh, we just thought we'd give it a go. Um, <laughs> um, it will be because, well, we want to embrace cloud or we want to, we want to be able to access data or AI and it's like, okay, well, I can understand that. So the training that we're doing then isn't skills-based training, it's workflow training. And there is, as you'll appreciate, there's a nuance to that because you could go anywhere online and do an Adobe 101 training. Um, but what we do is understand the, the foundations of that learning, but really understand what's the vocational application that you're trying to achieve that's going to drive you business value. Right. So let's use the Adobe one as a good example where uh, the, with ITV, where the business objective was to find a more, a more efficient way to drive production. What we were able to demonstrate was that if you were to move to an Adobe um, workflow, you could leverage speech to text, um, sorry, text to video editing. 
and there were other sort of AI tools that we could plug into that environment that um, wouldn't wouldn't work necessarily work in an Avid environment. And so the objective was the efficiency piece. So when we did the training, it wasn't just like, is it Adobe 101? We took that team through and said, okay, well, we're going to take you through some skills based, but also we're going to show you why you might use these tools in an unscripted show um, so that it's actually genre specific and not even genre specific, it was show specific. So our training is, um, whilst it's scalable because it's repeatable, um, but at the same time, it's quite personal. And we actually got the train, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the team that went through the, the, the experience, we got them to actually get their input before we started it. So this is what we're going to show you. Is there anything we're missing? So they felt that they were really engaged in the process, um, before we started so they felt like yes this is actually what we wanted to learn not what adobe want you know their their sort of off the shelf um uh thing was so so i think f for us that's that's our learning experience it's got to be a reason there's got to be a, a business reason for doing training and it's got to be resulting into you know a job related outcome um but i think what's been really interesting for us jan is that it's not just been uh editors but actually i think working with producers um as as well and an understanding the sort of slightly broader um set of tools that you do when you're working in cloud so again working with some of the producers that have less perhaps they're not on the tools doing the editing but for them doing the text to video editing is really important because they're pulling together the story of the shows so that's the tools they use there and we're also then showing them okay how do you use frame io to to the best advantage how do you manage the review process in cloud how are you collaborating how might you run a virtual uh, online using a, a a virtual streaming service so it's slightly broader than just the tools it's actually understanding how do i get the most out of being in cloud how do we use tools like iconic and other media asset management tools um because i think it's it's broader than just saying this is how i did it in soho this is how i expect to do it in cloud it's like it, this isn't a lift and shift and, and if you think that you're actually missing the point because there's other great things that you can do and i think that's kind of our responsibility is to say you know as people that have been doing it for many years now is to say here are some great tools and also i mean just today someone was like hey have you seen this great tool i'm like no love to, to see that how do we bring that in and then how do we train and upskill our community so, you know, define a typical project for us and then walk us through how you price for the various components of your service within that that project. So maybe a small movie production or a you know, typical project for you. How do you charge the the uh, the company for your services? You know, all three of the, the legs that we talked about. Yeah. And again, not trying to be a politician, but it is the classic. <laughs> it depends. Um, so I think ultimately when we're engaging with a, a client, we want to assess well, what are you trying to do? What you, um, Because we want to work with people that are looking to do some level of uh, transformation into the cloud. Um, and so for that, that's looking at doing a bit of discovery work, a bit of um, transformation design, and then the training becomes part of that. And that training is dependent on the size of the cohort um, and the, the tools that they want to use. But ultimately, they're using our cloud stations in order to do that. So for that, we're charging approximately uh, £80 a day to do that. Um, but but, but the, the wraparound service around that it sort of depends on the size of the project. So uh, whether that involves, um, uh, yeah, how much hands-on training, how much support, um, as well as, you know, getting into the technicals around cloud compute, cloud rendering, et cetera. Okay. And what are the, what are the primary benefits that you're seeing? And, and by primary, I mean numerical ROI or cost savings, or, you know, what numbers do you throw around when you're talking to a production house looking to make this type of transformation? Yeah, look, uh, it's time. The number one thing is that I, that, that, that sim it's easy to talk about is time because I think people, um, a lot of people organizations i think look at cloud and they think oh it's expensive you know cloud compute cloud storage it's expensive and and i think if you're doing a copy and paste from a traditional on-prem workflow into the cloud i can understand that position but i don't think they're looking at it from a value point of view and for us what we've demonstrated is there are efficiencies 
um, and we're only just getting started. You know, we we also feel that um, for some productions we're still learning, but we also know that there are always increased ways that you can drive the efficiencies in time. So, you know, if you think of a log process before you get into a an episode of Unscripted, you spend a lot of time on um, transcription and transcoding and sync pool and all of those bits. And what we're seeing is somewhere between 20 and up to 60% in time savings. You know, and again, I can't be specific because it is slightly project spent, but as a minimum, I would expect to see at least 20% time saving, but we have seen up to a 60% time saving just by increasing the or reducing the friction between moving through some of those stages. Um, and the great thing is that that also doesn't remove any of the human editing time um, that's that's required. If anything, it just means that the editor starts with the project you know, really well prepared and the producers really well prepared because we're just able to provide tools. And so time is really the factor. And, and I think particularly when you look in the market right now where, you know, there's lots of job cuts and restructures and, and, and then the people left are quite often lumbered with, you know, the outgoing team's, you know, job list. So if you can say to them like, well, actually we can, we can make those jobs slightly more efficient. So it's actually doable. That's kind of where it's, really helpful so i think time is the re- is the main factor and you then have a choice as a business do you cash that time in and put it to your bottom line or do you actually use that time to put that where it's going to be seen which is on the screen yeah improve the production who are who are some of the companies you're working with you mentioned i i itv or ipt who who you mentioned one company extensively yeah, so who well, else yeah, so working with ITV Studios, we're working with Publicis and some of their agencies within. Um, we're working with some brands as well. Um, so I think ultimately, we. I think when we began the business, we were working with lots of small to medium production companies. Um, and I think what we were doing were was a nice to have. Um, I think for large enterprise organizations, it's a must have. If you're trying to scale with efficiencies and move around the world, uh, or move your productions seamlessly around the world. That's typically our our, our sweet spot for clients at the moment. Okay, I, I saw Netflix on your on your website. Is that a case study you can talk about, or what you're doing with them? Yeah, so we had done a, a show uh, through one of our production partners called 3 dd um, and uh, that was a Netflix series that we had did. I think we've done a few uh, through them, um, and yeah, that was a really great one because we were able to. Uh, connect with um, uh, animators around the world. We were able to spin up our edit suites around the world, um, which I think had been challenging and cost and cost inhibitive previously. Um, and another good case study we'd done earlier in the year uh, was with um, BYD, so a car manuf- electric car manufacturer that was launching in the Middle East. And we ran that production, very fast turnaround, literally from the time I took the call to the day we were in the field was probably less than two weeks. And we were spinning up uh, production. We actually ran the production. We had a production team running out there and we were doing live streaming from three cinemas across the Middle East and then going live out to um, NBC. And the production in the build up to that, so all the the, the, um, the VTs et cetera, that we filmed had to be filmed within de- days slash hours before this went live. So we had uh, our team of editors and animators uh, working from uh, London, Amsterdam, France, uh, Northern Italy, I think. And quite frankly, it wouldn't have been done. It wouldn't have been able to achieve that, that, that production in the time we had, had we not done that in cloud. Um, and, the, and And also we saved... It was like 78,000 air miles. So what was really great about that story was that, A, we made it, it, we made it happen, um, and being in the cloud workflow made that happen. But also, particularly for an electric car manufacturer, we, we could demonstrate this was a very, very, very sustainable production as well. Okay. Uh, you've got a pretty small team on your on your website. I think it's uh, up to six or seven names, but you, your your capabilities are quite extensive. Um, who are your technology partners who are helping you make this happen? Yeah, so our team's probably slightly bigger than what's on the website. So I think there's about a dozen of us. Um, and we 
our partners are we have big friends in in high places so um we have a really fantastic partnership with um uh adobe and avid uh with aws uh, with google and also we work very closely with base media cloud uh, who are our infrastructure partner so that's kind of how our business i think also that reflects how we deliver the service in a really federated way is that we're we're always trying to work with the best in the business and be agile rather than have a sunken cost of a product that we're trying to um to flog but instead we just want to work with great partners that back us and we back them and i think that's the best way to work so you talked a little bit at the start about what your background was. How did you move from actual production? I guess you had production houses, but how did you move from a physical house into the cloud? I mean, walk me through uh, the mental aspect of that and also the timing aspect. How long did it take between conception and product offering? So, um, so I ran a previous business and I suppose Edit Cloud came from being at the, the coal face of that business. And it was before anyone knew what the word COVID was, we were already looking at cloud-based productions and had been since 2016. And I had already reduced my CapEx and started moving into cloud. I think it was just fortuitous for us that A, that we had a product that we were able to leverage for our productions in the cloud. But I think secondly, my when my CapEx cycles were up for renewal and my building leases were up for renewal i took the decision to say well listen i believe that the future of the industry is going to be in the cloud and in embracing this technology and i felt that having a building was distracting me it was giving me a safety net that wasn't helping growth so by removing that safety net um has made me focus on being in cloud and so that's that's really what accelerated us so i know lots of people talk about we work remotely and we can remote in and some people say, oh yeah, we can do that. It's like, yeah, but we are completely cloud native. Um, we're not remoting into some building or some data center. Um, and I think that's what differentiates us from our competition. Okay. Listen, Simon, thanks for taking the time. This has been great. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it.